Hello. Austin. <laughs> you said that like inquisitively, as if no, you're not no, sure I'm, if it's me or not. No, I just I'm normally I'm normally used to saying hello to more people. Oh, I'm sorry. Taylor I said just, that he wanted to, he was a, he was going to originally, but then he he had to he fell behind on the video he's doing for his own show, so he's doing that tonight instead. So that that takes a uh, that takes priority. I understand. I understand. How could you sell me out like that, Taylor? I loved you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I like him. We get along okay, but you know, how are you, Austin Yorski? I'm okay. I've been busy. I'm sure you didn't listen to it, but did you see that me and Taylor did an hour long thing on? I did. I saw your your little substitute on Thumb Wars, Persona Three, Persona Four. I logged I logged onto the internet yesterday, and I was like, "Huh? Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna listen to that." <laughs> Well, A, you don't have any idea what the hell we'd be talking about, but B, I would have went, no fucking clue. It went way longer than I expected. Sean came back like a couple hours ago, and the first thing he said to me, let me pull it up. What happened to Thumb Wars never being longer than twenty minutes? I am just a point. <laughs> Was that the edited down version two? The one that oh, was yeah. published? There was like a half an oh. hour more. Jeez. Jeez, Austin. Jeez. We didn't even get around to like half the shit I wanted to talk about either. That I could do an entire website on this series. I, well, I remember you commented the other day that you felt like we were transforming Blistered Thumbs into a, an Atlas fan site, really. Sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, whatever news leads, right? And if yeah. Atlas has the news to publish, we're going to publish the news! Uh, I didn't even get to mention There was one thing I wanted to bring up, because I, I talked about in the show how... I wanted there to be more like Mass Effect like consequences to the way that the interpersonal relationships work in Persona because it has like a, it has a dating aspect to it. But you know how like if you're dating two girls, they'll fight in Mass Effect, right? There's yeah. that there's that scene where like I guess like Jack and Miranda like go at each other. There was nothing like that in the original Persona Four. You could be banging the whole team and no one would even bring it up. But in they added in the golden version for the Vita, there's a scene if you're dating all of them and then you don't choose, you have to like crush each of their souls individually. Like you bring them almost to tears and then you just walk off like a fucking asshole and it is glorious. Maybe I do need to play this game. You could it's it's really hard to get you have to be dating everyone, which is already an achievement in and of itself, and then you have to commit to nobody, and then they all just like realize it at the same time. And just like all run away, it's it's so you're good. A douchebag. That's the thing though; they don't really call you out. They just kind of they just kind of like sadly realize what's going on and run away. Slash, it says like the the text to be like she looks like she's about to cry, and then it'll just like fade out for that person. <laughs> it's right. really good. I'm such an asshole though. That's all I wanted in the game was for it to acknowledge that I am a terrible monster. Is that that's something that you actively like seek to do in video games though, isn't it? <laughs> So when whenever possible, <laughs> and then I, you have to do it both ways. Like you have to have a file where you're Paragon, and you have a file where you're Renegade, so you can see Did it all. Did you find that being evil in like the Fable games was incredibly underwhelming, though? I'm trying to think because I I played as little fable as humanly possible i did play them but that is probably working in your favor then <laughs> yeah they were just blandy i remember i think it was in the first fable like the most evil thing that you can do the most evil thing that you can do is divorce your wife what the fuck is that i feel like that's a culturally bound kind of thing because some some societies look down on divorce uh, others not so much I know, but if it's not working, you know, and you're beating your wife and things like that, <laughs> she burns the roast, and you're like, wouldn't the best thing for you guys really be to separate? Wouldn't it be? That might be the actual moral thing to do in that situation. It would be. It would be the moral thing to do. But there's, o there's only so many roasts that you can be burned before it's just it's it's over. Exactly. You know, nobody needs that kind of performance anxiety in the kitchen. <clears throat> Because my girlfriend beats the shit out of me when I burn roasts. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the 50th episode of our Count to 50 podcast. Yes, on the Learn to Count to 50 podcast, myself and Austin Yorski do our best to guide you, our listener, through the magical and wonderful journey of counting 
all the way to 50. So regular listeners of the cast will know that last week we covered 49. Uh, and before we get on to the meat of this week's podcast, we're going to go over a couple of tips and tricks to help you get to where we are today. Um, some of those that you should remember are um, always count up. That's very important. You'll never get to 50 if you start counting down. Uh, you don't want to skip numbers. That's usually bad. So whole all numbers, all numbers is important. Uh, and, uh, and you want to go with whole numbers, integers, because if you stop to count every fraction or decimal, I'm afraid, theoretically, you may never actually get to 50 in your lifetime. Now, uh, a couple of you, uh, listeners excuse me, uh, to the podcast have, uh, have emailed us this past week uh, and have expressed that they've had a little trouble getting from two to three. So in order to help those listeners out, uh, this week we only have two hosts of the podcast. Uh, that is myself, uh, Mr. Johnny Maloney, and my cohort in ridiculousness, uh, I mean numbers, pardon, uh, Mr. Austin Yorsky. Uh, Austin, do you have any tips for the listeners before we get on to the bulk of today's podcast? Were you huffing paint when you came up with this? No. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, how did you think I was, how are we, I don't, Johnny. So no no special tips, Austin? Johnny, look at your life, <laughs> look no at your rhyme. choices. You got Nothing? Because I'm trying to be helpful here, Austin. We, as educators, have a responsibility to our audience. There's only so much comedic potential in counting to 50. I feel like you're wrung it all out. You, you, did, you did good, but I, I got nothing for this. Well, if you're not going to help me, then I'll just have to do it myself. Okay, so, go. As some of you may know, after 49 comes 50. There we go. Congratulations, everybody. Well, it was a fun ride. I'm glad that we could keep this podcast going as long as we could, but after 50, I'm not really sure there's anywhere else to go. 51? Mm, I suppose we could do that, but we might have to save it for next week. I mean, who would ever do 51 episodes of a single podcast? That seems a little excessive. It does seem, it does seem a touch ridiculous. That's, I mean, that's an, an unusually odd number. I'm fairly certain it's even a prime number. I think this is the moment. You could you just hear it for a second there. When this show jumped the shark. I don't know if this was the moment, Austin. If this was the moment, I'm, I'm fairly certain that you've completely misjudged our performance up to this point in time. Either that or you've blocked some things out, which I think is actually distinctly a possibility. No, I, I remember every terrible, possibly illegal moment that we've recorded. I'm just saying, we, there was a consistency of awful that we had maintained up until this point. And then we, we just... We, 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 we superseded the awful boundary? Yeah, we we've, we've redefined awful. We've gone plaid. <laughs> what, what what is it they call this in spaceballs? Uh, ludicrous speed. So yeah, we, we've hit ludicrous speed. Is that it? Pretty much. Um, I see. Here's the thing. There's only two of us this week for reasons that are long and boring and whatever. But I am still excited for this show because something so terrible happened that it it. I feel like this may be the best that we're ever going to get a Johnny's Rage, and I'm really excited. To it doesn't have it. to be a long and boring story, Austin. We could we could possibly delay this rage by, I don't know, making up a story about sword fights and missing hands and plague and, <clears throat> I don't know, an invasion of grasshoppers or something like that, but you, you want to do this? You want to you wanna go right into this? Well, speaking of making up stories, I know you didn't listen to it, Johnny, but on the um, Thumb Wars episode I stood in, I said that Sean had face herpes, and that's why he wasn't there. Uh huh. So if you want to make up an excuse for why we don't have another person, we could throw someone else under the bus. I don't care. Um. All right. Why don't we say that James Costanzo, who's always been eager to do this podcast, always he's always a keen mind. <clears throat> he's always interested in getting in on this. James Costanzo had his eye poked out by a donkey wielding an extremely sharp carrot. <laughs> he got into a fist fight with a donkey that was armed with a sharp tuber vegetable and has been reduced an injured monocular Canadian as a result of that. Shame. For shame, James. For shame. 
I'm going to have to go ahead and admit that's not where I thought that was going at first when you said he had his eye poked out by a donkey. Um, I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to confirm or deny where I thought that joke was going, but uh in fairness, this donkey may or may not have been trained by the Navy SEALs. To poke out eyes with a carrot? That seems like oddly specific training. You know, <clears throat> there were some really, really, really strange assassination attempts uh, programs that, that, that had been designed around Fidel Castro. <laughs> like exploding mustaches and stuff? Exploding mustaches, carrot-wielding donkeys, songs made out of AIDS. You listen to them and you get AIDS. You know? Have we made have we made any AIDS jokes on the show yet? I feel like that's like the the last of our bingo square. I don't know, man. I I kind of I kind of feel like Leon may have at some point in time made an AIDS joke, but then you know I just kind of default to that position where I'm like, hmm, that would be offensive if somebody did that. Ah, uh, Leon probably did it already. <laughs> I, just, I think we hit all of the taboos, though, so now we can just cross that one off, we can move on with our lives, and we can yeah. talk about, well, talk about, once again, Gearbox Software, your favorite developer. Fucking Gearbox Software. Good God, man. You can't go one day without sucking on it. <laughs> I'm, I am trying to remember, I'm trying to remember the last time that I, like, legitimately respected them. <clears throat> and every, I mean, All day, every day, Johnny. You love yeah. Gearbox. It occurred to me today that I was like, okay, all right, let's be fair. Borderlands 2 was, was all right. I liked it, you know, but but it wasn't really a moment where I was like, oh, finally, I have faith in Gearbox software again. It was more along the lines of, okay, all right, you guys deserve another chance. You deserve my attention. You deserve the benefit of the doubt, and I'm willing to give that to you, and you – ah, fuck, 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 god damn it. They stepped in it again. They fucking <laughs> stepped in it. What the fuck are they doing? Honest to God. Like, what? They're rebounding around this goddamn industry like uh, like a blind pinball. Just, you know, like, they're fucking, like, left and right. They have no fucking clue what they're doing. One minute it's like, oh, well, you know, like, let's take Brothers in Arms and we'll make it this game called Furious 4. Okay, well, we don't really want to call that Brothers and Brothers in Arms anymore. All right, so let's do this other thing. We're going to publish Duke Nukem. And everybody says it's a crap game, and I don't know why you think it's a crap game, because we think it's awesome. And by the way, we're so excited about Aliens Colonial Marines. We can't wait to start work on it, but we're not actually going to do any work on it at all. We're going to get a bunch of other people to do work on it. And then we're going to say that we did the work until people are like, oh, my God, this game is so bad. Then we'll be like, oh, my God. We didn't do any of it. These guys did. We asked them to. Ha ha ha. You know, fuck, the response to, like, why the fucking E3 footage of, of Colonial Marines was better looking than the actual release of Colonial Marines, they were like, huh, we'll have to launch an investigation. This is not the fucking Senate. You know, like, I'm, I'm sorry. That crossed your fucking – you looked at it, and you were like, it'll do. Ah, oh, God, good God. All right, okay, I'm sorry. You know, I'm getting a little off topic here. Um, um, this is what the people came to see, Johnny. <laughs> this is what okay. I'm. That's what I'm here for. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's let's actually discuss the news that that was dropped today. Um, strategy gamers, real time strategy gamers, bands together, stand fast with me here. Okay. Um, Relic Entertainment's Homeworld games, uh, Homeworld one and two. And I guess Cataclysm, but, I mean, you know, Cataclysm was sort of like an off... Sh I'm getting off topic. Homeworld, as, a, as, as an intellectual property, as a franchise, was it firmly in THQ's pocket before THQ went belly up and had to auction off all of its properties in order to um, pay its debts. So, all of the popular AAA franchises like Saints Row went to... Uh, uh, one major auction that they held some months back. Well, last week, the more observant of you, uh, the more of you that uh, those of you that are more obsessed with the news than some, uh, may have learned that uh, a bunch of THQ's secondary uh, property was being auctioned off in, in, in sort of a lump sum auction. Now, the highlight of this, people were concerned pretty much chiefly with, with two properties, because everybody was a little surprised that Darksiders didn't sell uh, in the first auction. So people were concerned with that, but then there was this jewel of a real-time strategy cult hit in there uh, known as Homeworld that, that went up for auction uh, last week. And when the news first dropped that the auction was done <clears throat> and they were talking about who didn't get it, I was optimistic. 
people were talking about how a Stardock Games didn't didn't get it. A Stardock is a, a a publisher of some some great strategy games, uh, both both real time and and turn based. They they published Sins of a Solar Empire, which is pretty much like the closest thing to a homeworld like game I've seen since Homeworld 2 was published. You know, they, they very recently had uh, uh, Elemental Fallen Enchantress is currently in beta. I've, I've had access to that. I'm playing it. It's way better than, than uh, 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 Elemental War of Magic is. They fixed tons of things. There's all these, like, new features. It's, it's great, you know. Um, we learned that Paradox Interactive, Paradox Interactive, who throws a lot of, of, of shit at, like, the gaming dartboard, and some of it sticks. Some of it's great. Some of it's really derisive and, and just kind of, like, copies shit, you know. But, like, Crusader Kings 2 was fantastic. I think they do Europa Universalis as well. You know, like, they, they've got some great strategy games, some really, like, mechanic thick. They're not the gorgeous, most gorgeous games, but, but some really, really innovative strategy games. They didn't get it. So everybody, everybody last week was like, oh, my God, you know, like, Paradox didn't get it. Stardock didn't get it. Who, who could have purchased this? What, what magnate of industry? Could Sega have bought it? You know, like, did they buy Relic thinking that they were going to get this? Is Creative Assembly going to get it? Who, who? And the news drops today. Fucking Gearbox Software. Fuck those guys. Not only have they, like, the, the, in the last, like, eight to, like, ten years, they've got maybe two good games that they've published. They've never in their fucking lives made a real-time strategy game. They, they've never even looked sideways at a real-time strategy game. There hasn't even been, like, a section of a game that they've made where it was like, oh, click on this unit, then click somewhere else. Congratulations, you just played, like, two minutes of a real-time strategy game. Like, they don't, they've never, never even, like, they've never even betrayed a slight interest of getting into the genre. And then all of a fucking sudden, we learned today that they bought Homeworld. And it's like, oh, shove a sharp stick in my eye. Why would you do that? Why would they do that, Austin? You're really all about the eye mutilation today. I, I just, I, I can't understand for the life of me. I'm, if you're going to buy something, you better have a fucking plan to use it, or you really know better than Electronic Arts, who, if you will remember, during the 1980s did fucking nothing else but buy up a bunch of small studios that may have had, like, one, like, you know, good-looking game that maybe needed a little more polish but could have been developed into something fucking amazing, and then they close down the studio and sit on the fucking IP. They still haven't fucking done anything with Mirror's Edge. That was interesting. Has anybody made a game like that since then? No. But, you know, like, 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 they've got all of Origins games. They've got all the fucking, like, uh, Wing Commander games. They've got Ultima. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. They're remaking Ultima 4 as a free-to-play browser-based game. Fuck you guys. Like, what, what plans could, could Gearbox possibly fucking have for the homeworld license are we going to get a homeworld first person shooter because that's all gearbox has ever fucking done i don't want a homeworld first person shooter nobody wants a homeworld first person shooter if you don't believe us ask the guys at 2k marin whether or not they got a really nice reception when they admitted they were doing a first person XCOM shooter nobody <laughs> wants that game nobody so I think it's safe to say that you are not particularly happy. I am I am incredibly displeased. And I think it's fucking ridiculous that already there are all these people who are fucking jumping out of the woodwork saying, oh, but you know, the first thing that they said was is they want to make, like, first order of business is make Homeworld 1 and 2 available on modern day systems. I'm like, fuck, do you think that anybody else who bought that franchise, that either Stardock Games or Paradox Interactive, were going to buy Homeworld and then just be like, nah, fuck Homeworld 1 and 2, we're just going to make 3. Every anybody anybody who bought Homeworld would have done that. Even fucking Pixel Games or that Pixel Studio that crowdfunded seventy five thousand dollars to make a bid on the franchise, they did it because their first mission was to make sure that Homeworld one and two comes to fucking modern day platforms like uh, uh, um, touch touch screens like iPads and telephones, good old games, Steams like digital launch platforms everywhere. Anybody who bought that license would have done it. The question is, after that, what are you going to do with it subsequently? Gearbox has never, they, like, 
I don't think that Randy Pitchford has ever been sitting on his fucking toilet and even thought to himself for a second, hey, wouldn't it be funny if I did a, like, real-time strategy game? Ha 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 ha, no. It's, like, why? Why would they do this? <laughs> Apparently just to piss you off. Apparently, they've got no business meddling around in this goddamn game. Considering that they, like, they've already proved that they are fucking rubbish top to bottom dealing with, like, other people's intellectual property, possibly with the exception – actually, no, you know what? I'm even going to say that, that their first entry, that Half-Life Opposing Force, was short, it was underthought, and it was – it was like, it added nothing new to Half-Life. It really, it really didn't. It was kind of derivative, you know? The only franchises that they've done well with are ones that they've created themselves. And even then, they have kind of shown that they can, they can sort of mismanage that, like with this whole fucking Furious 4 bullshit that went and came. And I don't know what it is. It's not a Brothers in Arms anymore, but I know they tried to sell it to us as that. That was a pile of shit. God! Johnny, do you need me to be here? You can just scream into a microphone for an hour, and I'll just publish that. I mean, I just – I don't know why they would bother unless – like the only thing that, that it, it, it stinks of is that they know that gamers are clamoring for Homeworld to be released on newer systems, like on good old games or even on Steam or something like that. And and they could make a quick amount of cash if they charge fifteen dollars for like a Homeworld HD version. Because I think it's pretty obvious to say at this point in time that that Aliens Colonial Marines probably didn't fill their coffers up as much as they hoped it would. Yeah, I mean, I think the bigger fallout from Aliens will be their reputation. I don't think anyone's going to ever work with them again, so they might just need to buy up IP and develop it internally to stay afloat. Yes, but what, they're going to do that with Homeworld? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, like, Homeworld is, is great. Like, they're great games, top to bottom. I fucking love them, you know. But it, it's not the kind of IP that you want to hitch your studio to so that it can drag you out of the muck, particularly if it's your first fucking RTS. Like, they, are, they have put themselves into such a position here where... Some of the best, like, probably the, the only fucking fully three-dimensional, or the first at least, fully three-dimensional real-time strategy game that everybody recognizes right out of the gate. There, there, you know, there are a couple of other ones. There's, like, what, what is it called? Like, the, 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 the uh, Jupiter Nexus or something like that. Um, Endless Space. I, like, I, I can't remember if Endless Space is, like, a full three-dimensional game. But, like, even even, like, just sort of hobbyist strategy gamers. You like Homeworld, and they're like, oh, Homeworld! You know, you don't grab something like that and then be like, man, I hope we're good at this real-time strategy thing, because if you're not, you wreck it, you dig yourself deeper, and, like, people get fucking even more angry at you. It's, this is not a good plan for them. I mean, it, it's entirely possible to have people on staff who have RTS experience. That may be true, but together as a team... They have not made an RTS game. Do they have the patience to make an RTS game? I don't know, man. What if they used the Homeworld license and just called it Borderlands 3? I bet they could do that. Sometimes you fucking depress me. <laughs> Come on. You, you know they'll actually put some effort into it if it's Borderlands 3. Fucking shut up. <laughs> oh, don't even. Don't even, man. Don't even. So am I happy that, that Homeworld is probably going to be coming to good old games and Steam? Yeah. Do I wish it was in better hands? You bet your fucking ass I do. I've been waiting for a Homeworld 3 for fucking ever. You know, like, here, I've got my copy of Homeworld 2 right here in front of me. 19... Mm, no, wait, sorry. Uh, 2003. 2003. There we go. Ten years. I've been waiting, waiting fucking ten years for more goddamn Homeworld. Ten years. And then I learned that fucking Gearbox buys it. God Damn it. Is this the worst possible scenario? You know, I thought about this for a second. I'm like, is there anybody out there that I wouldn't want to have Homeworld more? And I dithered a little bit on EA. Mm -hmm. I did. I was like, uh, uh, you know, like, I'm not really happy with some of their corporate choices, because that would mean, like, Homeworld with, like, 
I don't know, fucking microtransactions or some shit, and, and then being like, oh, well, you know, you don't have to, like, pay the microtransactions, or it'd be some fucking, like, free-to-play browser game or something, like, when they announced the new CNC game was only gonna be multiplayer, and it was gonna be free-to-play, and everybody was like, why would you do that? And they were like, well, okay, I guess it doesn't have to be, but it's still gonna be free-to-play, it's just gonna have, like, really bare-bones single-player, you know, like... So electronic arts, that would suck. That would really suck. I wouldn't I wouldn't like that at all. But at least they've done a real time strategy game before. I could I could kinda rest easy that whatever's coming out the other side is gonna be recognizable as a game that, that I'd be like, Oh, hey, that's Homeworld as opposed to I like I don't know what Gearbox is gonna do with it, and it's really obvious that they bought it without having a fucking clue what they wanted to do with it, because they've already got a, a like a forum set up on the Gearbox website that's like, hey, do you have any great ideas for a homeworld game? Tell us, and that's like, so you bought this fucking thing without even having an idea what you wanted to do with the franchise? Was it was it an impulse buy? I was like picking up some gum at the counter on your way you out. Know, <laughs> no, they talk about how the chief creative officer, like, was really, really excited and spearheaded the project. I think that's the, the, the phrase they, they used, spearheaded. You know, and, and it was like, and Randy Pitchford was mouthing off on his Twitter that it was like, mission number one, bring Homeworld and Homeworld 2 to current digital distribution platforms. And I'm like, okay, that's that's great and all, Randy, but tell me that you spent, I don't even know how much fucking money, to buy this franchise because you have plans for its future. I have my CDs of Homeworld and Homeworld Cataclysm and Homeworld 2 right here. They never went away. Would it be great if I had, like, the convenience of having them on good old games or Steam? Totally. That'd be very convenient. I think it'd be fantastic if mobile gamers could play touchscreen versions of it. That would be really cool. But, you know, the real tragedy of THQ sitting on this license was not having access to, like, Homeworld Online. Because you can still buy it secondhand off of, like, eBay, Amazon, internet stores. You can buy this game if you want it. You can. The real tragedy is that nobody was doing anything with it. And I'm really worried that that, that that's just going to be the case, that we're going to have another fucking developer who's like, yeah, we bought Homeworld. What are you doing with it? Nothing. Nobody gains anything from just sitting on an intellectual property, particularly when you have studios, smaller studios, clamoring for access to things like uh, like access to these these uh, IPs. You know, like uh, Disney buying LucasArts, right? Are they going to make another Monkey Island game? Bet your ass they won't. The other week, Ron Gilbert published a uh, a little treatise where he was like, what I would do if I was to make another Monkey Island game. Bracket, not that I'm making another Monkey Island game. You know? And, like, right off the top, he's like, I would have to own the franchise. And I'm like, well, good luck with that, Ron. I would love to see you own the franchise. I would love to see you come back to Monkey Island. I would love to see you make this game. But Disney's going to sit on it. They're not going to do anything with it. They paid for it, so they're going to not use it as much as they want. Can you explain to me in, like, business terms how that works? Like, if, if you own something that you're not using, aren't you losing money? You would you would think so, but, like, the, I can only imagine that they're like, oh, well, if we were going to make something, it would cost this much to make. And I imagine that we'd only make this much money selling that thing that we made, so we'd probably lose more money by, you know, by deciding to make it. But people do it, you know? People do it. Like, I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that Electronic Arts lost money making Syndicate. I'm, I'm willing to bet they did. I don't know how much it cost them, but I don't think they made their money back on it. Yeah, I mean, I can see that you, if you don't think you could make money with it, but then why would you sell it? Why? I, the, only, the only reason I can come up with that, that is, like, why you wouldn't sell it is because you don't want your competitors to have something. Well, yeah, but I mean, they're not selling it to DreamWorks. There's no reason for Disney not to let another game developer make a Monkey Island. It's not direct competition. You would think, you know, that it would it would sound like a kind of a reasonable business deal to be like, we're not using this. I don't think it's really going to get into any of our products. It's not going to mess with us. I guess we could let it go. 
But apparently nobody in, from business school thinks like that. They think like when you've got something, don't sell it. Hold on to it. It's yours now. <laughs> what well, sounds like it's like the corporate version of hoarding. More or less, yeah. More or less. And it's and, not like it's not like for example with Homeworld, it's not like they're trying to keep it away from their competitors so that they don't compete with what they have. They don't obviously have any RTS franchises that Homeworld would compete with. So I don't know, see why they wouldn't do something with it. It's I would hope that they would. You know, but I got no faith in it. I'm sorry, but, you know, considering how much they mouthed off about how they love the Aliens franchise, and it's just like an absolute dream for them to be working on an Aliens game, anything that they say about how much they love or respect the Homeworld legacy, um, I believe we've be given, been given sufficient reason to doubt the honesty of those statements. Well, yeah, they clearly blew that. They're, they have no – there's no trust with the public anymore after that whole debacle. Zero. And so they decide to follow up the giant debacle of, you know, butchering, like, a beloved franchise, an amazing series that had so much potential to be a great first-person shooter by buying up another beloved franchise that fans have been clamoring for a sequel for because, you know, they just love it so much. Ugh. they're going to have to work so hard to convince me that anything they are doing is worth my time, or even worth considering canon. If indeed they decide to make a Homeworld game, who knows, maybe they'll juggle around some ideas for like a year, and then just be like, fuck it, it's too much trouble, and bury it. Which is not really a better alternative, but it just brings us back to sk square one. It's like, well, you just shouldn't have bought it in the fucking first place. Well, okay, let me throw out some names out here. Would you prefer... That, that Homeworld was with Gearbox or Peter Molyneux? Actually, I would I would rather it was with Peter Molyneux. Okay, David Cage. Oh, God. <laughs> Gearbox. Really? Yeah, I'd rather it was in Gearbox's hands than David Cage's hands. <laughs> I think that just said a lot about us right now. So look on the bright side, John. We found a silver lining. I feel dirty. I feel dirty now, Austin. You posing that—that's—that's that's awful. Why would? Oh God. I feel <laughs> it could, unclean. <laughs> it could be worse. Yeah, yeah. It could be. It could be. See, Peter Molyneux made strategy games. That's yeah, but he's also—he's also disappeared into the dark void of his own butt. I realize that, but that doesn't mean that he can't make another strategy game again. <laughs> Did you hear what he's doing with the cube? Yes, and it's awesome. <laughs> I'm not even mad. It, it, if you're listening, in case you haven't heard, Peter Molyneux's experiment, Curiosity, What's in the Cube, is a game where you pay to take layers off of a giant cube. And everyone in the world... You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. You can just repeatedly click on the cube and remove these like tiny pixels one at a time. But people are paying. They're paying a lot of money to poke this cube. And they have been for months. And now he's added an option where you can pay to add to the cube to fuck with the people who are paying to remove things from the cube. And they're doing it. People are giving him money to do this. And I would be mad except for what he's proving a point. People are fucking idiots. I, you know what, if there was, I have my doubts about Peter Molyneux, but when I read that, I was like, oh my god, he is a genius. It'd be one thing if this was a, a tremendous flop, like it just failed, no one played it. But apparently, there's, he is, he's proving something about the human psyche which is that we have no idea what's best for us. Yeah, I think actually every governmental election that's happened in the world since the dawn of time has pretty much illustrated that. But yeah, there's really no plainer um, uh, evidence than, than what Mr. Molyneux has demonstrated. When the aliens come down or the rapture happens and we have to, we have to stand trial for all we've done, all they'll have to do is point out the, the stats. For the Curiosity Cube, and we'll have no defense. Yeah, that'll be the end of it right there. <laughs> you idiots paid to put layers back on a cube that the other idiots paid to take off? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, this cube doesn't actually exist? No, Your Honor. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not even a real cube. Not even a real cube. <laughs> oh, this is... I, see, the cynical part of me wants to think that they were getting close to the middle, 
and then he was like, shit, we can we can get some more money out of this before they, <laughs> they get there. Or maybe even better, he still hadn't figured out what was in the middle. Because there's no way, we don't even know. He could he could have just started this without an actual clear idea of what he's going to put in there. And so this is just a complete and total like last-ditch effort to prolong the inevitable. It may be. It may very well be. The mind of Peter Molyneux is a tough thing to crack. Maybe that's what's at the inside of the cube. Maybe it's like an artificial intelligence computer upload of Peter Molyneux, and it like explains all the decisions he's made. It's, it's show Danim you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In any case... The yeah. moral of the story is here that Gearbox has absolutely no business mucking around in my fucking RTSs. Yeah, that was great. I didn't even have to really add anything to that conversation. You just went off. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning on, on the subject, not of Gearbox, but of the THQ sales, that some other franchises also did go to uh, some other companies. Uh, as I was saying to Austin before we officially started this podcast here, this will be the day that gamers remember the, themselves uh, uh, when asking of THQ properties. Um, who? You don't know Nordic Games? Nordic Games? Only... No. <laughs> they own Gothic. I know that, alright? Gothic. And I mean, it, like, Gothic has been uh, unfortunately, you know, Gothic is kind of a niche in the first place. It's sort of like hardcore CRPG kind of style, you know. But even then, it, like, uh, Gothic has kind of tumbled, I think it's safe to say, uh, in the past couple of iterations that have come out of Gothic. Um, but yeah, you know, they also have Arcania. Woo! But now they own Darksiders and Red Faction and destroy all humans. Yeah, and it'd be great if we saw something like that from those, you know, but... Well, they... Okay, here's the thing. They bought all of the THQ IP besides um, some stupid DS game I've never heard of and Home Homeworld. So they're not going to make 80 games. <laughs> No, no, I think Nordic Games is probably going to sit on them, especially considering how much fucking money they spent on it. Five million dollars. Well, 4.9, but but five million dollars. I'm sorry, you spend five million dollars on like 80 different games? Where are you going to get the budget to make one? Yeah, I, I'm curious about the the long-term plans here, because they can't think they're going to put out, put out entries in all of these series. I guess, I don't, What what would even be the plan? I think I think that there's probably a couple of people in these companies that are thinking that they can make a quick buck off of selling old stock. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. Not that, you know, like, I'm, I'm really sad about that, because it would suck if, you know, you wouldn't be able to buy Darksiders anymore, you wouldn't be able to buy Red Faction anymore, or, you know, a any of these other games, right? But surely you can't just spend, like, that much money buying up all this stock, and then be like, right... Here are all our new projects. Yeah, I mean, do you see them releasing anything in any of these series? I mean, I would imagine Darksiders and Red Faction would be first. Probably. I know that there's a couple of hardcore fans out there that really love Destroy All Humans. I think if we got another one of those games, that would probably go over pretty well. You know, Supreme Commander still has some clout uh, in terms of the, 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 the real-time strategy crowd. They still like that shit. They eat it up. But, again, you know, I, I don't know whether or not that means that they're going to have the confidence to go forward with a Supreme Commander game. So, that's, but that's, I mean, that's the death knell of THQ, right there. Pretty much. I, I have no idea if we'll be seeing any of these projects again, so this might be the end of everything. We're going to see, we're going to see, I know we're going to see Homeworld and Homeworld 2 make it to digital distribution platforms. Yeah. Old games probably, and, and Steam as well, I imagine, you know. I'm just kind of curious as to how uh, a Gearbox is going to price it. I think according to the pricing, we'll see them uh, do it. We will then be able to determine how desperate they are for cash. <laughs> so let's let's put that off to the side, you know. We'll shelve our anger for the moment. And uh, our anger? I, I'm trying to invite you into my life here, Austin. <laughs> trying to share something with you. Okay. I'd... I want you to feel what I feel, which is a bit sweaty. But in any case, that, that was kind of gross, actually. <laughs>
I don't really feel a bit sweaty. It's actually a little chilly. I've got the I've got the window open here. It's beautiful in British Columbia right now, but you know, like it's still a little chilly. The sun's going down. Ah, what a gorgeous day. In any case, um, we're going to move along here to um, uh, across the the pond to uh, bonnie old England, where I mean, this isn't really necessarily game related news, but it's kind of funny. Um, particularly considering all the drama that's gone on surrounding Activision's franchise. I say franchise because if you don't know what I'm talking about, I, I imagine you probably don't play video games at all. Call of Duty is, of course, what I'm talking about. Uh, and we have a, an, an article, a, a news story, that emerged today um, with just a little bit more scandal being heaped on the Call of Duty name. Now, not necessarily on the Call of Duty name in that it's like, you know, you're not shooting innocent people in an airport or hiring hookers for an elementary school or burning down a school for the blind. To be clear, all of all of which happened. Yeah. In real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. Citation needed, but... Just, just so we know. Um, but story is that... Uh, a public relations rep stole a little bit of money from Activision for reasons that I'm gonna go ahead and say were a little frivolous. Not not quite uh, in the best interest of the military first person shooter genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I, I I believe that the PR industry, particularly for video games, has come under fire fairly justly uh, in the past few months. <clears throat> we have had. Uh, public relations people throwing inappropriate parties. Um, we have had uh, public relations firms threatening to pull review copies from certain websites when scores aren't as high as perhaps they had hoped. Um, we've had some PR people crossing a line into games journalism where they shouldn't perhaps wear their heart on their sleeve as much as uh, they do. Um, we've had uh, libel and slander suits from quote-unquote gaming journalists who, <laughs> you know, might have their um, uh, their bread buttered on one side or the other. But this one, I think, is just kind of funny because, because this one, it's not like scandal about, you know, reviewers taking back pay or someone flipping out. It's about a PR manager who stole like $30,000 from the launch market, the launch budget uh, of marketing for Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 UK's release and spent the money on an engagement party, um, build them 2,000 pounds, so like $5,000 for a luxury hotel stay with her fiancé, uh, shopping sprees, a bachelorette party, an engagement party, and even got one of her friends to misappropriate, like, 5,000 pounds for, like, their personal use. <laughs> and, I mean, as if that's not, like, wow, did did you think that that you would get away with that? Like, <laughs> like no one would notice. As if that's not good enough. Um, the uh, the PR manager who was found guilty of this had her eighteen month jail sentence suspended for a really important reason, Johnny. Oh uh, yes, of course, an absolutely important reason. You see, the judge made special note that. This court case has put some tension on her marriage, and, oh, you know, like, she, she was pregnant at the time, and it caused her to deliver her son prematurely. And going to jail would have a, quote, devastating effect, end quote, on their ability as parents to care for this son. So, moral of the story is, if you're going to go on a crime spree, get pregnant first. It was so, so easy. I, you know. That's not even a loophole. That's like a loop chasm. A loop gorge. Pretty much. Like, at what, at what point in time does it then become, like, do you just, like, wander up to her front door, knock on the door, and be like, right, <laughs> time to go to jail now. <laughs> like, is there a proper time in a child's development where their parents can be incarcerated safely? Like, when does that come about? I don't know. Is so, it like, like, the the bar mitzvah? 
Is it a deadline? Is it like your son better learn to make his own sandwiches by the time he's eight? Because that's when you're going. The, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into the specifics of British law here, but this is just the weirdest story ever. And actually, it's funny, full disclosure, uh, Yusuf Alshaker, the UK correspondent, I guess, for Blistered Thumbs, knows these people. He's told me, and he, it's the reason he didn't write up the story for Blistered Thumbs, is because he actually worked with them uh, for Activision coverage in the UK. And that was it was pretty funny to see him like recognize in real time that he knew these names as he was reading the story. So, Yusuf Al Shaker. <laughs> keep must keep some pretty seedy company. I just picture him he's like in the bar from fucking what's that movie, um, Block Stock Two Smoking Barrels where they're planning yeah. the heist. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It would explain how he managed to finance his amazing gaming PC the other year. And and he just has like he owns like literally every game that's ever been made. Just like a physical copy. He doesn't play them. He just no. sends me pictures sometimes. He's like, hey, look at my, my Soy Coden 2 copy, you dick. You're so jealous of that, aren't you? I'm really jealous of that. That's bullshit. And also his Fire uh, Fire Emblem Awakening? No, he he has um Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. Yeah, he has a copy of Radiant Dawn for the Wii, which jumped up to like $150 last year. Yeah, he's been he's been absolutely smattering his Twitter feed with photos of games just to make you jealous, I think. Yeah, he's a real jerk, but now we all know that his, his underground video game PR connections will be the, the end of him, because they're cracking down. Yep, it's true. He's dirty like a ditch digger. Somebody look that guy up. So now the only way out of the situation is for him to get knocked up. <laughs> <laughs> That's an image that I'm not really comfortable having in the back of my mind. <laughs> With that luxurious beard and that pregnant belly, yeah, I don't know about that. It's funny. It's funny that you say the word luxurious because the one thing that jumped out at me about this story, besides just the overall silliness, of the whole thing was that in the statement from the court they said, um, "The world of PR, you are surrounded by luxury items. That is the reality for people working in the industry." Like I've talked to a lot of video game PR people, and they like have trouble like making ends meet. Is the UK PR industry completely different? Is it like opulent? Is it like is it like Hollywood? There's just like cocaine parties every week. I think he must be confusing video game PR with other PR, like like <laughs> any industry PR. ever. Yeah, you know. Because even even if you work for Activision, like you are not in like a penthouse suite just because you send out the press releases. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, if that was the case, I doubt this woman would have stole 10,000 or, you know, fucking what, it's like it's close to like 15,000 pounds, 16,000 pounds somewhere in there. Yeah, if if you were surrounded by luxury items, you don't have to steal that money. You yeah. just b- build the company. I I'm always confused about when I say this how these people think they can get away with it. Like no one's going to notice that all that money is gone. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't. Maybe she just thought that like, Call of Duty was going to be such a huge success, and I guess she was correct that they were just going to make all that money back and it didn't matter. But it obviously did matter because she was charged. Well, the charged, but I mean, she's not in jail, so... Not yet, but I mean, she still was sentenced. She's got 18 months of prison that she has to do at some point in time. Wait, what if she get... 18 months, what if she just gets pregnant again? Huh. <laughs> Theoretically, this could just be a, a cycle. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. That's depressing. <laughs> Avoid, avoidance of justice by pregnancy. I wonder if that's a thing in America because I've never oh. heard of this before. No way, no way. They would they would throw anybody in jail in America. Huh? 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 There's a thought. Anyway, yeah. not really video game news. Just thought it was funny. I wanted to share it with people specifically because it involves Yusuf, and that's a that's a, it's a new running thing on this show. We just talk shit about people who aren't here. Yeah, fuck those people. Do you have anything you want to say about Taylor behind his back? Uh, you know, he's not as handsome as they say. Yeah, we really we really uh, oversold that. He's we okay. Did. We really upsold it. He's a good-looking guy. You know, he's got nice teeth. His eyes are pretty brown, and it's like, oh, I don't even know if Taylor's eyes are brown, actually. he's pro- I'm probably going to get an email from him. My eyes are green, you fuck! <laughs> Is that how he thought? I don't think I've ever, like, seen him or heard him, like, angry. Nah, Taylor's pretty... He's a straight shooter. <clears throat> he's pretty zen. Patience of a saint, that guy. I kicked his monkey ass on that debate, though. If you don't believe Austin, go check it out now. <laughs> People were mad. Someone in the comments who called me Leon, by the way, said, Leon just yelled at you for an hour and you accepted it. <laughs> it was great. I wonder if people have been thinking all this time that you're Leon. 
Well, we've had a couple episodes of Adam now. You'd think they would have acclimated to the sound of our voices. I wonder if that means they think I'm you. Yeah, you, I, I mean, white people all kind of sound the same. What if this is? What if someone listens to this and just think it's one person talking to themselves? You know, somebody did actually propose that to me at one <laughs> point in time. They were like, "I think you guys are actually just one guy." I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past us because you know. Here, Austin. I'm gonna drink a glass of water. You sing a song. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not singing a song. Goggle of gear. I, I would rather have them think that this was just one person because that's kind of impressive. That would be impressive if this was just one person. We should we should just go run with that and see if we can get like a voice acting gig. So am I you or are you me then? We are us. That's deep. <laughs> we are Legion. <laughs> and now I think we should move on to the most complicated part of the show. What, what are you playing? Um, I played Injustice Gods Among Us for a review. My review for that is up on the site. Did you see it, Johnny? I did. You punched a guy. It was great. I punched a bunch of dudes. Here's the thing. Um, I, I really did like the game a lot, but I had there were some plot holes in there, and there was some fun conversation in the comments about whether or not they were plot holes. Who a did lot you of them play through the game as. I'm curious. Uh, the story mode it ta- it it's you, it you, dumps you, you play as there. a bunch of people. Oh, yeah, okay. it's like chapter one is Batman, chapter two is um Green Lantern or something. Okay. Yeah. So that I, I I mean personally I've been playing a lot of Catwoman. Yeah. I, I, I dig uh, the way she plays right now, but I'm, I've tried everyone quite a bit for review. I had to get a kind of a sense of all different characters. Who's your favorite? It's hard because I, I'm i not a super big comics fan, but I did grow up with like, the Justice League TV show and stuff. So, I mean, I like some of the characters. Maybe not so much their characterization in the game. I can't really pick any favorite. I'm, I'm bummed that the Martian Manhunter isn't playable. I like him. That's pretty lame. Although he does float in the background of one of the stages, just just there, just not lifting a finger for anybody. Yeah. Which is kind of a douche move. Um, yeah, the plot holes. A lot of them are spoilery, so I can't go into too many. But there's one I wanted to run past you, okay? All right. Here's the setup. Batman has a suitcase. Inside the suitcase is the thing he needs. It's locked with a DNA lock. He needs, like, four specific heroes to touch this thing so that'll unlock it. Okay? You with me so far? Uh huh. The heroes aren't available for plot reasons, so Batman d- interdimensionally summons them. He he d- either finds a device, d- creates a device, whatever that rips space and time to transport these people from another dimension into a dystopian reality where they have to run from you know an all-powerful, basically godlike authority figure to unlock this briefcase. And when you get there, they just touch the thing and it opens. And you're given no sense that Batman couldn't have just taken a hammer to the suitcase and got it the fuck open. Do you not consider that to be a little ludicrous? Um, I believe, as my father would say, that sounds like a bucket of shit from China. <laughs> why, why China specifically? Because it's far-fetched. Oh, I get it. See, here's the thing. Someone, the best excuse I heard, or the best justification I heard in the comments was that Batman would have rigged the suitcase specifically to destroy the contents if it wasn't properly opened. I, I can kind of buy that. Maybe Batman would have a contingency plan. That is not brought up in the game whatsoever. There is no inkling of that. It shows the interior of the suitcase. It looks like it's just an empty-ass suitcase with a thing inside of it. Like, that's for the plot. There, you don't get any even hint that there was any kind of, like, backup plan that they, he couldn't have just... Even even if it was, like, made out of, you know, diamond or something, he he could have just gotten, like, a laser. I mean, he, if, he can, if he can obtain an interdimensional transport machine... Dude, dude can open a suitcase. Yes. In I, fact, I would think that it would be more likely that fucking Batman had, like, the DNA of the entire Justice League in, like, a freezer somewhere. Yeah. I mean, if he's so crazy prepared, you'd think he would just have that shit on file. Yeah. Yeah, probably. So that whole thing to me was just a little bit silly. I mean, the worst part is that Green Arrow was there, and he's like the comic relief character, so you could have just had him quip. He could have just been like, can't open your own suitcase, Wayne? And then Batman could have been like, uh, if you don't open it properly, it'll destroy the contents. Like, all you need is like a throwaway line, but you get none of that. They just pull it out of the wall and then put it in the machine, and, and it just pops open. You and know, you... It's, it's kind of amazing how often that sort of happens in video games. How just like it, how you know sometimes I just feel like like video game developers and video gamers and, and and whatnot we get so wrapped up in all these fucking like super ridiculous weird realities and situations 
that somebody is like, and then he has to get the briefcase open. Oh, how does he do that? I know. He opens an interdimensional portal to draw the four heroes from an alternate reality to then open the case. And there's not one dude in the background being like, can he just get like a fucking hammer? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the whole plot device is specifically because it, it is the catalyst for the plot, because without it, these heroes wouldn't have come to this dimension to solve that dimension's problems. So I understand it as a device. All they just needed was some kind of line to explain why Batman couldn't open his own suitcase besides the DNA lock. I guess the DNA lock was their their plot hole plug, but they don't give a reason why alternate methods wouldn't have worked. And it's not a super big deal. This is also a game in which Superman, not, not villainous Superman, totally good upright Superman, vaporizes a bunch of civilians, and they don't even address that. Like, <laughs> like... There are plenty of other plot holes to pick on. This is just the one I thought was funniest. And I got called out for it because people did, did they were like, you know, whatever. I don't want to get into it. It's not a super big deal. I just thought it was funny. Well, you know, people are going to jump to defend Batman. They will. <laughs> Batman's, Batman's got an entourage about the size of the internet. I don't know if you've noticed. I mean, Batman's a pretty cool dude. Uh, he is. He's, he's pretty cool. Uh, I will say this, though. It's like anybody that's like, ooh, if you could choose to be like any superhero in the world, who would you be? And people are like, Batman. I'm like, no, fuck that shit. Batman, you have to do sit-ups in the morning, son. Like every yeah. goddamn morning. You got to get up and do sit-ups and push-ups. And yeah, you got like billions and billions and billions of dollars, but you never get to use it because you're always working out. And then you fight crime. And when the fuck do you sleep? Man, no. Give me Bat Superman. I will take Bat that. <laughs> Batman is a lot of work. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry. No, not a chance. Yeah, 9 out of 10 people, if they got their wish to be Batman, would soon become Fat Batman. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't last. Behold, I'm your worst nightmare of the night. <laughs> Hang on. I dropped my inhaler. Yeah, so the DC Universe is full of interesting characters, but this def it definitely feels like a Batman versus Superman game. Well... And it, yeah. yeah, it's fun. I like it. It's, I just I'm not going to give it 10 out of 10 in free blowjobs just because it has some nice cutscenes and stuff. You know, there's issues with it. But yep, yep, yep. that was just a thing that's up on the side. I probably said more than I should have about that because that's all already available to read. So I've also been playing uh, Persona 4 Golden, which I, <laughs> is another game I've spoken at just at so much great length about. it. I don't know how much more I have to add, but that is also a thing that I'm playing, and it's good, and you should play it if you haven't. Um, I'm also playing Soul Sacrifice for the PS Vita. That's not out for like a week, so a lot of that's embargoed. I don't know what I'm allowed to say about Soul Sacrifice. I guess I can say what's in the public demo, which is good. I'm gonna I'm gonna hedge my bets here and just say the demo is good, and the demo is a part of the game that will it will be in the game that you can can play. I wonder if I'm sophisticated enough to make certain extrapolations about the quality of the game in accordance to your opinions of the publicly available demo. I see what you did there. Time will tell. Who knows? I know. It's a mystery to everyone. That's the thing about like gaming PR. Usually they don't care if you break embargo if it's positive. It's just when it's the negative, then you have to watch out. Yeah. So if I came on here and I was like, so I'm playing Soul Sacrifice, and it's shit, then I would be in trouble. But the demo is really good, and I'm playing the game, and the demo is part of the game. Actually, they just cut it out. It's just like a just a vertical slice of the game. Interesting. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I, that's that's what I've been playing. I'm also they just sent me a code like an hour ago for a game called Black Rock Shooter, which to me because it's uh, Nippon Ichi, so I was like, oh, uh, you know, Japanese shooter is like, oh, it's probably some bullet hell thing. But I looked into it, and it's First of all, it's Japanese as fuck. It's really Japanese. Uh, second of all, it is, I guess, an RPG? It, despite being called Black Rock Shooter? That's a really misleading name. But apparently the name is the name of the anime. So in adapting it to a video game, I guess they just got stuck with a name that is indicative of a genre that it is not, which I guess is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anything about Black Rock Shooter besides what is, I guess, on the Wikipedia page, which I skimmed. And I will, I will start playing that as soon as possible, I suppose. But I'm just... If anybody has any insight on that, like, if, it, if anyone's a fan of the anime and can tell me about it, that that would probably be helpful. Because it's... it's You know when you see, 
things, Johnny, and you're just like, man, that is Japanese. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all anime girls and robots and giant improbable, like, machines and just no clothing. And way out of place, like, super poppy songs. <laughs> I haven't heard the soundtrack. I imagine it's J-pop. Because I like that is something that's always kind of weirded me out about about Japanese games, or you know, indeed, I suppose Asian games would be it would be fair to say. Is I always feel like there's some kind of weird dissonance between the actual content of the game and the soundtrack. Some of the games will have these like super brooding, like completely horribly emo, like detached from society, hair over their face heroes that are like, oh. I'm so tortured. When you turn it on, the music's like... I'm pretty sure that was an offensive uh, rendition of what Japanese music sounds like. Well, I, I don't know any Japanese songs off by heart, but they're like, you know, they're upbeat and like lots of, you know, super, I don't know, squeaky vocals and like, it's just weird. I know. Me, I, I wasn't trying to imitate the Japanese language. You know, no, I know. Just being like, <laughs> that was the, the tune you were going for there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, purely, I know what you're saying. Purely the instrumentation. T- Taylor and I literally talked about this for like 20 minutes the other day on the on, in the Persona video. I one of my big issues with Persona 4 was the fact that its soundtrack is is happy J-pop when it's a game about a serial killer. I won't go into that again. Exactly. Like, that fucking freaks me right the shit out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing that over here. Oh, no, he must escape. Have you seen the comment thread on that? It's it's amazing. I mean, was... I love... I know I know that people love their J-pop, and that's fine. I'm not going after J-pop. I'm not being like, fucking J-pop sucks. Why don't you listen to real music? Nah, nah, nah. For that... Um, <laughs> that smoke on the water? It was going to be, but I decided to stop, because I don't actually like smoke on the water. I mean, it's not, like, Stairway to Heaven or anything. It's still good. No, I uh, I have a thing about, like, I don't know, old music and, like, relative to contemporary life in certain situations. It's, it's weird. I've, I'm very temporal about my music in terms of, like, when it was made, what it was made about, whether it's relatable to this and that. It, uh, it's, you know, like, it would take me forever to fucking talk about. But, yeah, I'm not going after J-pop. I'm just talking about, like... The the point of music in other mediums is is to to emphasize. It's to highlight. You know, it's it's why sound in a horror movie is so important, or absence of sound in a horror movie is so important, because it it requires such a deft touch to bring m- certain moments, very specific moments, to the forefront. Because you can't just have this, like, you know, dread through the whole thing. You know, there needs to be a way to draw certain moments out. And I've just, I've never gotten the J-pop thing, where it's like, like you said, yeah, this is a game about a serial killer. How are we going to write this song? I know, a horn section. <laughs> but, I mean, plenty of people were passionately defensive of it, and it's it's fine. I just thought it was a strange choice, and... Well, I don't know how oh we got here from Black Rock Shooter. I'm interested now. I have to hear the music for this game because I, so you, the, say, you say Black Rock and I'm like Ultima Seven. Oh wait, no. It is neither Ultima Seven nor a shooter. So that is the next game I'm going to play as well as Soul Sacrifice. My review for both of those should be up soon as possible. There isn't a embargo on the Black Rock, but there is one for Soul. So yeah, are you are you playing anything, Johnny? I sent you Slender to review, and you just you don't care. I actually I did I did get a little bit of time to play Slender this week. Only a little bit of time. Other games I was playing this week include Johnny Hunts for an Apartment and Johnny continues to train a guy at work. And Johnny goes to his girlfriend's grandfather's ninetieth birthday. Uh and last night I played Johnny Goes to the Vancouver International Film Festival, but I mean that's neither here nor there. Um Yeah, I did I did get to play uh, like an hour of Slender. Um, and I discovered upon trying to resume my game later in the week that it wouldn't let me. <laughs> was there a specific loading screen where it was just like, no, you're not allowed? No, insofar as that it, it has no system for that. Or um, for saving? Yeah. And to, be, I, I guess to, be clear, the, to be clear, this isn't the freeware Slender the Eight Pages one. It's the no, new... Slender the Arrival, the commercial release that you can buy for money and play, having paid for it. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I played for like an hour or so, and then uh, I quit 
after looking around for like a save game function, I was like, oh, I guess it must just work on a checkpoint system. It doesn't. Um, there are stages. There's like I think five stages. And when you complete a stage, you can then, like, choose to start your game at the next one from the start menu. But I had not completed the first stage. Um, so I went back, and I was like, I'm, I'm just going to play this for 30 minutes or something like that. And it was like, start game. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And it's like, congratulations, here's the beginning. And I was like, but I, but, oh. So that was kind of disappointing. Um <laughs> And I, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm only, like I said, I've only played about an hour or an hour and a half in it, and um, uh, I guess I could say some things about it, even though I plan on on writing a review for it. Hopefully, um, this week I've got some free time, kind of like squirreled away. It's been a, it's been a tough time in in the Johnny Maloney sphere lately because things have been weird at work. I have been hunting for an apartment. I think I found one, um, so I'm I'm actually going to be filling out the application for that later today. Um, and hopefully dropping it off tomorrow. Um, but um, my girlfriend is currently going through finals, so she's been really stressed out, and I've been trying to keep her stressed down. So my, my life has been my, the, the time I've had for gaming has been pretty minimal, and and I'm really annoyed that that they've made this game and not accounted that somebody might want to sit down and play a game for just like 60 minutes and then get up and leave. Um, it's the fucking 21st century, people. I have a life. I do. I want to play your game, really. But you're making it tough for me. Um, and, you know, initial impressions are not great. Um, I'm, I'm ha- I have a couple of problems with it. Um, kind of relating back to what we were talking about, like, you know, games being a little gamey. You know, like, you get so wrapped up in this, like, these, these ideas of, like, how a game works that you kind of miss out on some, some small details. You can see the puppet strings is what you're trying to say? Yeah, you know, like, I mean, the game starts, and you have parked your car at the end of an improbably long driveway, you know, in an autumnal autumnal forest area. And, of course, it's like, oh, you know, like, walk down the driveway. I'm like, okay, I have no idea what I'm doing here or why I need to walk down this driveway, but all right, let's go. And your character is holding a fucking video camera because you're walking down a driveway. Why not? Um... And then at the end of this improbably long driveway, you know, to the point where you can't even see the road anymore, you find a house, and, like, the front door to the house is open, and I guess you just take it on faith that you're supposed to walk into this house. So you get in the house, and there are, like, notes around for, like, this person who's like, hey, thanks for looking after this house, and you're like, oh, okay, maybe I'm here to look after the house. The house is, like, the most impractically lit house I've ever seen in my entire life. It's like it's so obvious that they're like, ooh, spooky, scary game, where it's like there's one light bulb in a room, you know, it's like, you know, behind the couch. And you're like, who the fuck would decorate their house like this? Why? Huh? It's more like a horror movie set than an actual house. It really it really is, you know, and and then so I've got no idea what I'm doing there. Maybe I'm supposed to look after this house and I'm wandering around this house and I find a flashlight. And it's like the only way that you can navigate through this house is with the flashlight. And again, I'm like, why the fuck would you design your house like this? You know, I, I'm just trying to find the bathroom or something like that. It's like there are no light switches on any of the walls. You know, I realize that you're making a horror game here, but this is a fucking house. It's just a house. They're lit. I live in one. <laughs> Sometimes. And then, you know, like you, you, you get upstairs to this one room and there's like a smashed window and, you know, like, notes and stuff around, and you look out the smash window, and then you hear somebody scream at the back gate, and then it's like, quick, go investigate the scream at the back gate, and I'm like, no. I'm locking the door and calling the police. <laughs> yeah, are you fucking stupid? No, I don't have to go to the back gate and see who screamed. Not a chance. <laughs> I, like, why, why would I do that? Why, why, you know, if I'm hanging out in my house, right, and I hear fucking somebody scream outside, I'm not like, quick, Run towards the danger. <laughs> Self-preservation. It, it, like there's there's no there's no reason, but it just it like it just banks on this like winking kind of nudge nudge. Hey, you're playing a video game, right? And it does all this when you launch the game up. It gives this there's this big like spiel at the beginning that's like when you play this game, please try to remember what it's actually like to be in a situation where you're trying to survive. And I'm like, okay, one when you start a game and you tell me how to play it, I lose a little bit of confidence in that game. Because what you're basically saying is, uh, listen, this isn't going to be any good unless you play along. 
And games are normally like that. You know, they, they kind of require you to play along with them. You know, because anybody can be a dork in a game and try and, like, jump through a wall and, you know, like, crotch hump people in, like, multiplayer or something like that. So to out and out say it, to, like, to come right up to the player and be like, listen, uh, this is really going to be a subpar experience unless you and I make a deal, is, is not encouraging in the first part. But then when, like, the game starts, and I'm actually like, okay, survive. And it's like, go investigate the back gate. And I'm like, no. Yeah, I mean, th- you should be able to convey these things without outright addressing the player. Like, Amnesia the Dark Descent is never, like, there's not a message that pops up at the beginning that's like, it would be really helpful if you tried to maintain your sanity. That is the thing that humans do, and you are a human, presumably, so you should probably try to do that, too. Yeah, you know, like, pretty much. There are there are, are certain things in games that it's just kind of like it, it sort of comes along with. So there's no agency in the game in the first place. You know, like, it's it's all just kind of like, oh, you're playing a scary game, therefore this is a scary game. It actually reminds me, in, um, I think it's Super Paper Mario, which I played recently, at the beginning is like, it, it asks you, it's like, you want to go on an adventure and save the Mushroom Kingdom? Yes or no? If you click no, it's just like, okay, game over. And it kicks <laughs> you back to the main menu. Yeah, why not? I, you know? I thought that was really funny, because if you can, like, if it's like, go check out the noise outside, and then you can just close the door and just, like, crawl in the tub and wait, and after, like, five minutes, it'll just be like, you know, the police showed up, and <laughs> and it's just, everything's okay. Uh, you, you know, it, it it's, like, it's so obviously, it's it's over-designed. I'll, I'll put it that way. It's it's over-designed. Like, it, it belabors its own horror. Like, there are so many reasons that you can have for somebody, like, being in a house in the middle of nowhere and then having to go outside and check something out, and forcing them into a situation where they need to look out for themselves. Like, you can you can easily, easily do that. But to get the player to volunteer that behavior is... It robs a lot of the illusion. You know, like, like it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't quite convince me enough that I should be concerned about the situation. Like, there are ways to manufacture that like for example lone survivor you can just stay at your apartment safe you can just sit in there and not engage the horrors of the night all you want you will eventually starve to death yeah so you have to leave and in doing so you will discover the rest of the world and want to do those things so yeah you don't if you don't just be like put a prompt up that says go outside there are monsters don't get eaten like I- yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. It removes it removed the immersion from it, and, and it was actually it was kind of at that point in time that I was like, uh, you know what, I kind of have to go to bed, and I think I'll do it now. So, because that that's just that's such a do it because I said so, you know. <laughs> yeah. And that's 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 like one of the that's one of the worst motivations that you can give somebody in a video game because there's so many others that you can just do that are just like you can even just paint them as the hero you can just be like hey mario is the hero save the princess and it's like okay i have to save the princess you have a goal now yeah i mean it's a it's a well-worn trope but it works it, it, totally, you know, like I'm. What I'm saying is, is that uh, even way back when, when it was sort of just like, you know, video games were a brand new thing, and it was like, hey, save the princess. It's like, okay, I'll save the princess. It's it's easy to to give the character something that they have to do. Mm-hmm. But when you have no character and you have no agenda, and the game resorts to, oh, hey, do you want to finish this game? Well. Uh, let me tell you, in order to finish this game, you're going to have to do this thing, which by any means, in real life, if anybody did, would be fucking stupid. But you're, in, what... on the j- you're in on the joke, so why don't you go outside to where the scream is and check out the monsters? That's why I feel like I would be a terrible tabletop role-playing person, because they'd be like, you guys want to go on an adventure? And they'd be like, nah, just, can, I, can I just be a farmer? Can I, can I, can I go home? <laughs> like, I, wouldn't, I, I would never stay on the quest. I've I've actually I've had people participate in campaigns that that I have I have uh, managed that have done things like that. They want to be a character where they're like, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to talk to anyone. They want to be as removed as possible from the situation, and it it becomes you, the onus is on you as the person managing the story to manipulate the situation in such a way that they are either forced to be engaged. Or they find a reason to want to be engaged. 
What's funny is we talk about this like as some kind of subversion of like the classic hero's journey or something. But thinking about it, like what is the thing that defines most Western fantasy and therefore like role playing and Dungeons and Dragons and stuff? It's the Lord of the Rings and by extension, the Hobbit. Fucking Bilbo did not want to go on that journey. No, no, he didn't. Like the earliest example of a lot of the things we're talking about is the, is the reluctant journey. And like we. This, this isn't like some obscure thing we're talking about here. Everyone is drawing from this well, and how how we cannot get it done properly is amazing to me. I I, I can't understand it for the life of me. So yeah, some of the some of the management, like just just in the ways that the game is created, I can't really speak much to the content. I haven't even seen the Slenderman yet. You know, like I think that there's a lot of of really great concepts in 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 what they're trying to do because there's a lot of like you know. It's essentially a game about being stalked. My brother and I had a conversation about this a couple of days ago, and that's like that's a, a deep seated fear. Well, I mean, the concept the, of being stalked and hunted. You know, like there's a lot in that. The best but, the best horror icons and the best like um, if you want to call them like urban legend stuff, all have basis in fact or like actual fears. You know, like the the hook on the car thing. That's you know premarital sex, right? Yeah. And you have uh, Freddy is like, you know, people are, are afraid of their dreams sometimes. Like there's there's always like a basis. So, yes, if Slenderman represents being stalked, that is not only like a deeply seated fair, but also a particularly modern one with the way yeah. we have everyone connected and through the Internet and stuff. Yeah, it's it's pretty prevalent. There's there's a nugget there. There's a really kind of special. And I, I do not believe that it has been played out in in games, you know, like m- managing a, a, a stalking scenario in a game it, it's it's not it's not overplayed it hasn't tipped its hand you know it, it doesn't exist there's no such thing as like the stalking genre <laughs> i mean off the top of my head uh resident evil nemesis played with that a little bit but obviously i think i believe all those encounters are scripted yeah so yeah. to get i mean there's that game i actually posted about it today sir you are being hunted yep another game that i kickstarted yeah, as a procedurally generated type of thing. I think that's that's kind of interesting because we don't get that a lot, as you said. But there is potential because not only is Nemesis well thought of, but uh, Sir, you're being hunted looks pretty interesting because you really don't have the power to overwhelm the opposing forces. You're not, you know, you are not going to mow down all the bad guys and just be the last one standing. Yeah, you're you're under equipped. You have no allies. You know, it's. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that one. I admit it. But you know, I've got to say that some of the game decisions that they made with with Slender. Uh huh. I don't know, particularly in this day and age too, where I think I think they're charging twenty dollars for it. Is that right? I believe so. Sorry, let me check it out at, at good old games here. Uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, they're selling it for ten dollars. They're selling it for ten dollars at uh, at good old games. Uh, so that's that's not necessarily so bad. Unless it ends with a fist fight between you and Slenderman. But the thing about it, the sad thing about it is, is that we do exist in a like in a gaming world where ten dollars will get you a lot. Yeah. You There's know, a dissonance and, though because people are charging sixty dollars for things that you can don't be get in you an very act- much at all. Yeah, and then people will put like. <laughs> 500 hours into FTL or Minecraft or Terraria and then put put five hours into a $60 game and not, I guess, have buyers or more. This is amazing to me. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you're right there. But, um... So those are those are my initial thoughts of, of Slender, The Arrival. I hope to, uh, particularly uh, tomorrow, I should get some time to, to actually play it for, you know, like, a, a, a few hours at least. Well, I, I don't know. I have to drop off my apartment application. And then uh, it's my life is a mess right now, but I'm hoping that um, by the weekend I should have it finished. I don't think it's that long a game. I read on the internet somewhere that some dude did a speed run of it in 40 minutes. And while a speed run and review speed are probably at two very opposite ends of the spectrum, um, I think that's indicative that it's it's not really that long a game. So. Maybe I'll have some time this week to do one level and then, you know, quit and then do another one a day later or something like that. But I also played, um, did I? <laughs> Are you asking me? No, no, no. I was I was just trying to think if I, if I played anything else at all this week, and I don't think I did. I think I got, no, okay, I, I got like 30 minutes of like Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, but I talked about it last week at great length. So that's, that's really all I have to say on the subject. Okie dokie then. 
So, <laughs> you want to do an outro on this beast? Well, I don't want to give people spoilers to next week's episode, but I think it's going to start with the word 50. You're a jerk, you know that? Yeah, I know. But you keep having me back on the podcast, so I assume it's okay behavior. I mean, at this point, you have me back on the podcast. (laughs) You're the one that always calls me, so I assume that you're the one that starts the podcast. I mean, technically, but I'm pretty sure if you left, this entire thing would fall apart. I have no idea what I'm doing here. I hope not. I would hope that this would live beyond my death. uh, Well, I'll bury it with you. (laughs) Just you and the podcast in the grave? Yeah. Put some solar panels on top of the headstone and uh, have it power a battery that just loops these in MP3 format so that people walk by and suddenly all they hear is, The cheese cost And they're like, what? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, uh, man. What do you think about having uh, listeners on the podcast? I, don't, I'll, I'll, I won't leave this in if you have mean things to say. <laughs> I don't know. It could either work in our favor or be like an absolute disaster. Yeah, I've had a couple. I've had a couple people email me. Oh yeah, yeah. And they want to come and guest on the podcast. Yeah, apparently. I don't know who would willingly submit to this, but this, I, this is a I, real thing. Uh, well, you know, like it, it could, it could either work out or go sideways. Is is really the, you know. <laughs> I know, that, I know that you used to run the uh, the BT Community podcast. I did, and that was a glorious train wreck as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it it, it might give us a little bit of uh, some things to work with, I suppose. It's worth considering. Oh. I, I suppose before before we actually did wind up having them on the podcast, we'd probably have to talk to them a little bit and just, you know, like suss out whether or not we think they'd be <laughs> ra- radio ready, as as the phrase would be, I guess. But here's the thing. I'm not radio ready, so I feel like it's unfair to hold other people to that standard. Well, you know, I'm I'm casting a wide net over radio, ready. You know, I'm, I'm not. You know, we just don't want anybody being like. So, what do you guys think of Hitler? <laughs> Here's the thing, though. I think that would probably be our highest rated episode ever. Yeah, very possibly. If somebody actually, honestly asked that question, that'd be weird. Um, but yeah, I'd I'd be in for it. I'd be down if you're down. I'm scared. I don't. This I I. Who I are the people, do I do I would I know the people that are emailing you or are they just like Oh I, I don't recognize any of the names. Oh yeah? Yeah. Ah. Well Here, yeah, here's the thing. Like I have the the YouTube hits, but I have no no idea how many people download this. Yeah, yeah. So shit be cray. I miss yeah. Leon. <laughs> he was a grounding influence. Yeah. He was a grounding influence. He didn't always have that much to say, but you felt him. He was there in the room. Yeah. He was just silently judging you. When he chose to speak to, there was gravitas. There was, you know, like he seized the moment. It was like, I'm going to say something poignant right now. Yeah, just surgical strikes all day. Absolutely. Yeah, for the whole cast. The man carved up the airwaves. I think maybe I'll just sneak a microphone into his house. And then I'll try to just edit his day-to-day talking into the cast and make it feel like he's there. We could see if we could disguise somebody in Baltimore up as a child and go around to the schools that he teaches at. <laughs> okay, I didn't know where that was going at first. <laughs> <laughs> like, how are we going to use a child to lure Leon? And then, I didn't... I trusted you, Johnny, but... I skirted the edge of disaster. Yeah, <laughs> I'm never quite sure. It's what I do. <laughs> I, I, I just wish they would stop video games for a while. Just no more. Just for, like, a month... Yeah. Because I just, I need a break. Just no more for video games. Yeah, I get you. I get you. I would help, everyone could catch up on their backlogs. It'd be nice. It's like summer vacation, right? You can't go to school all year round. My goddamn backlog is huge now. I'm never going to get back to it. I've I've come to that conclusion. Yeah. It's it's impossible to catch up. Yeah. And the stupid thing is that it doesn't stop me from buying new games. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Even, like, you know old games that I've played before. Like, good old games is like, oh, hey, guess what we just released? I'm like, oh, my God, I've played that game, like, a dozen times. I need to buy it now. Seven (laughs) dollars? Fuck yeah! (laughs) Yeah, I know. I I, I own, like, three different versions of, like, five games. I have no idea why. 
it amazes me that companies are actually making profits re-releasing stuff or like upgrading stuff for new releases considering the state of things because i mean just this week there's the the dragon's dogma dark arisen which is basically just an exp- it's not even i don't know if you call it an expansion pack it's the same game with some new stuff uh dead island riptide which is a bit more expansive like it has new characters and new areas but it's the same game yeah. essentially and um Next week is the director's cut of Deadly Premonition. And that's like all of the big retail releases for these two weeks are like expansions and re-releases and updates. There's no like standalone products that are coming out outside of the indie scene. And well, I it's all about it's all about keeping your development costs down, you know, like and yeah. and that's it. As yeah. far as like retro games go and things like that. Like I mean Deadly Premonition, you know, to to say um that it was a a hit is to be a liar. <laughs> but you can't admi- like you have to admit after seeing it on YouTube and people doing let's plays of it and and the the infamy that it has acquired on the internet that there is probably more than just a couple of people who are like oh my god I'm going to have to buy the director's cut of Deadly Premonition when it comes out because they never got the first game because it slipped under their radar and then they saw some dude do a YouTube video and then they were like holy shit I need to play that game yeah, there's a lot of interest in it. My my question is how many people are really going to put the money down because A, they've already seen the Let's Play, and B, if they saw the Let's Play and were interested, why wouldn't they have picked up the first version? The first version came out for, the, was it the PS3? Yeah. I, I guess it's possible that there was like a limited print of it, and people, you know, it it's might possible. Have been, might have been, it might have been subject to availability. It didn't occur to me that it was a like a, a very widely produced and widely purchased game, even after its infamy. Um, twenty dollars used on Amazon. Yeah, but I mean, even still, you kind of like have to really want something to go to a Amazon and buy a used game. I guess. Like you've got to actually search for it rather than being like, "What's new? Oh, director's cut of Deadly Premonition. I'll take it." Like, me and Taylor were talking about this, because when Persona 5 comes out, we're both definitely getting it. But there was three versions of Persona 3 and two versions of Persona 4. So we're probably going to end up buying this game a couple times, and I feel like an idiot. Yeah. Yeah, that can be a little... I don't like it when companies do that. And I mean, you know, it happens to, like, a bunch of huge releases. Game of the Year edition. Yeah, I mean, I I said that in my Injustice review. I'm like, this is a good game, but it has a lot of DLC, which means it's probably going to get a Game of the Year edition, so... I mean, why pay 60 when you can work on your backlog until it's 40? Yeah, more or less. Whatever. It doesn't stop them. No, no, it doesn't, because people keep paying for it. Also, there's something to be said for, like, there's there's this kind of sense, especially on the internet, like, that we all have to be in on these things at the same time. It's like, if you're not playing Bioshock Infinite, you're missing out on the zeitgeist. It It is it is frustrating. I Like, it, it's frustrating for me particularly because... Yeah, you know, like I'm 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 at a point in time now where I I have a life, you know, like I'm 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 at work, I wake up really early, I drive to work, I drive back from work, like it takes up a lot of my time. And then in between that, I have to juggle having a girlfriend, doing things like feeding and bathing myself. <laughs> You, know, you, and, you skip those things sometimes, but... Well, you know, like, <laughs> maybe, but, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, the the very idea that, that, you know, I was expressing a couple of weeks ago, I was expressing a little bit of annoyance that people were, like, interrupting me playing Bioshock Infinite to ask me if I had finished Bioshock Infinite yet. And yeah. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm sort of playing it right now, do you mind? <laughs> I'm busy. Yeah, I mean, most of it's harmless, but you do get the sense that it's like everyone has to pay the $60 to have it, the experience all at once. And then if you miss it, then you're just a loser and you're, you're like, Jesus Christ, guys, calm yeah. down. It'll you're be not, there. You're not in the video games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. That's that's why I miss Leon, too, because he was so not about that. Yeah. He didn't give a shit. No, he did not. <laughs> yeah, so... And I guess in the end, unfortunately, it it wound up to his detriment and, you know, of of being relevant on the podcast, I suppose. Yeah, as much as I miss him, though, there's uh, there's such a unique perspective that we all got to watch someone fall out of love with video games. Because you'll never see that on any other podcast. Yeah, true. And it's... All professionals. Yeah, I mean, even if they did, they'd have to fake it, I imagine, to stay on there (laughs) and keep their jobs. But you kind of just watch someone 
who just like got fed up with the industry and just wasn't having fun. Nothing coming out was exciting them. It was just all homogeny, and it was you just saw what that could that toll. And that was I I think that was an invaluable experience. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it it really does kind of say something. I think unfortunately about the state of games right now. Not that there isn't. You know, there aren't companies out there that are trying to do new things or trying to do vital things or trying to renew faith, you know. Uh, even even companies that make games that you could describe as like triple A, you know, but so much of the time I'm spending money these days and, and getting burned a lot, you know. It's it's not it's not pleasant. But can you imagine like I mean if if they can't keep someone who's like a lifelong gamer in the fold, imagine trying to like attract someone who isn't even into the hobby, just like someone who you know, plays Farmville every once in a while. Like, how are you ever going to get them to support your your bloated budgets if you can't even keep the diehards around? It's definitely a problem. Definitely a problem. And I think actually more companies probably realize it than don't. Yeah. I mean, have you seen, like, I, it's been all over the mainstream news, like the quote-unquote Facebook game bubble has burst? Yeah, I, I read a little bit about it. And I'm not surprised, you know, like, because yeah. every single time any new market opens up, everybody imagines that that's where the free money is being printed. Yeah. Exponential growth is just not sustainable in any situation, and yet no one seems to remember that. They just think it's going to be free money forever. Yeah, and it, it's going to happen to the mobile gaming market if it hasn't already. <laughs> yeah, that's what to say. You know, and it's going to happen to free-to-play. Free-to-play is going to get it so bad. This year, we're going to see so many fucking free-to-play games come out, and if, if what you have isn't special, nobody's going to give a shit. Even if it is, sometimes people don't give a shit. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, just... it, it's, it's, the, it's the same as the MMO problem. Mm -hmm. You know, like, if you're not, if you're not all in on the ground floor, then you are competing with people who have, like, friends, infrastructure, like, all this shit that's been built up for them already. You're asking them to jump ship on all this customization and all this work they've done on an online profile. And not just, like, you know, like, having a page, but a profile in terms of who you play with, when you're available to play, how they like to play, how you like to play, how that works out together. Yeah, I mean, an MMO isn't just a game. It's almost like a, it's a social network in a lot of ways. Yeah. And and the free to play games are going to learn that. I just thought it was interesting because I mean there's a lot of like laughing, there's a lot of Schadenfreude about the whole thing. It's like haha, fuck those Facebook games. You know we we knew it all along, and I I, mean, I didn't really get that sense. I was kind of just like, well, there's a bunch of developers out of work. There's a bunch of companies that are going to fold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't Facebook was, game, but it couldn't. I don't know. It was it's it was lucrative. It was lucrative for a time there, you know, but. Part of the problem that you have, too, when, when you're developing a system, because, I mean, part, part of the problem you have with, like, Facebook gaming and free-to-play gaming, as a matter of fact, is delayed payoff. You have the stick and carrot, and you just eventually realize you're never going to reach the carrot. Yeah, because that's, that's what they are. It's like you're, you're constantly striving towards this, like, you know, a new level or new achievement. You're farm billing. You're planting your crops. You're baking your pies. You're giving your pies to your friends, and then it's like, oh, there's a new recipe, and you're like, fuck, well, I need to grow all this other shit now. You know, and it's, it's like it's constantly raising the bar. It's moving the goalposts always in one direction, and you can't sustain that. Because at some point in time, people just go, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm not doing this again. I'm done. Yep. I mean, even if your game technically doesn't have an ending, the player will reach one eventually, their yeah. own personal threshold. That's why I always prefer like games that have an actual ending, because you know you, you can't anticipate how long someone's going to stick with it, and if they like it that much, they'll play it again. I think as human beings, we're more, we're more suited. We're more affixed to finite experiences. Also, you know. apparently, apparently, this is actually something that they've been discovering. Like, I was reading a thing about this. Though, like, the Netflix has caused like this thing where people will will watch, you know, an entire show, like all of its seasons in like two days, right? They'll just binge watch it, and it's like changing our our TV habits. Like, people don't watch TV the same way they used to because of Netflix, and it's like it, same thing with like the comic book industry. Like, people don't buy a, the issue every week anymore. They just get the trade. Yeah. I can, and, I can understand that, actually. I've noticed that a lot of television shows have started advertising not watch the show, but watch it live. 
You want to, yeah, it's like that's something, yeah, with like the big shows like The Walking Dead and, uh, you know, Game of Thrones. It's like going back to the Bioshock Infinite thing. It's like you need to be there when it happens, experience it with your friends, talk about it. It's not like we don't, we're not just casually and passively consuming this media anymore. Yeah, it's it's becoming a, a club thing, you know. They have like live tweets and hashtag this during the show to win a script or a T-shirt, and you know they're, they're like they're trying so hard to engage the audience immediately. And I'm like, ah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can see it. I can understand why a, a room full of rich white people would think that is what they should do. And maybe they're not even wrong because I mean, look at the fucking ratings on The Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. So, but. I, I just don't feel the need to be a part of that conversation. Like, I don't feel like I'm missing out if I don't know what everyone I know thinks of a certain episode. Yeah, I, I've i actually, I only just started watching the uh, the third season of The Walking Dead. I haven't even started yet. Because I was just like, yeah, I'll leave it around until they all arrive. And then if it's like really dramatically compelling, then I can watch like two or three episodes at a time. But I'm not really finding it that dramatically compelling. So I'm watching like one a week. Yeah, it's if, just if that. Yeah, it's interesting though because I just we, a lot of times we kind of just take for granted that all of these mediums are static, but t- technology is kind of changing the way we consume everything. And you know, people talk about the death of television, but it might not die; it might just change. I I believe it is changing. I honestly do. You know, considering that that the rise of services like Hulu in in states, and you know, you can go to like any network website and watch like any TV show that they publish any time of day. And and yet I'm scared of an always online cloud gaming future. What? It, how is that? What is the difference there between not wanting everything to be Gaikai and on live, and yet being perfectly okay with all of my TV being streaming? Well, I think it's just a, a matter of of the pricing schemes. I was I was thinking it was like a sense of ownership because you have a save file and that is you. Yeah. But when you're watching a show, you know you don't have a stake in it. It's not like they can lose your place. But. Yeah, that's that's true. And I mean, there's there's also the matter of of like their control over the medium versus your control over the medium. Like video video games are inherently interactive, you know. Like it's it's nice to be able to convince us that we have control over what's going on. Mm-hmm. Television is entirely passive. Yeah. You know, like if you if you flip on the television thinking that you're gonna see your favorite TV show and it's like breaking news, you're like ah oh, fuck. But it's not like, I paid for this cable and now they do this, you know, but if you like $60 for a game and you sit down, could you imagine getting like breaking news in the middle of playing a video game? Well, I mean, did you see some companies have, I'm not sure, was it Sony or Microsoft? I don't want to just say one or the other because I can't remember which. They patented technology where they could show ads during gameplay. Oh, good God. Are you serious? Yeah. Like, obviously... They, they no one confirmed that they're going to use it, but that was the worry. That's fucking ridiculous, man. Can you imagine though? Like you're playing like the latest Call of Duty, and it's like get the terrorists in Sector Seven, and it's like after this break, <laughs> drink, <laughs> get the terrorists after this cool, refreshing, refreshing glass of Mountain Dew. <laughs> ah, kills thirst fast. I mean, uh, on one hand, it, it's not really that different from what we already accept on television. But on the other hand, it feels like it is. It feels invasive. And why is that? What's the difference? I, I, again, I think it's because of, of control. Like, you can control the pace of a video game. The pace of a television show is dictated. Like, you know, it would be different if you were – like, every TV show was an hour-long movie. And then the network would just randomly decide when commercials go in. But they they write television that way. They write it for commercial breaks. Yeah. You get natural breaks in the drama. There are moments where characters look at each other, and there's a musical sting, and then you're like, oh, look, Swiffer Wet Jet. I mean, we've been, we've been conditioned to accept that, so theoretically, couldn't they do the same thing with video games? Couldn't all AAA games have natural commercial points? I can't believe I'm saying this. It's conceivable that they could, but it would, it, it would mean like compromising the, the immersion of the game. Do you feel television is compromised? I do. <laughs> okay, well... Okay, there, we found we found the root there. Well, you know, the reason why I say that I feel that television is compromised is because there are examples of television without commercial breaks. Yeah. And they are some of the most highly acclaimed shows on TV right now. Uh-huh. Game of Thrones, you were just talking about. People are watching it like crazy. 
I say that I don't watch TV anymore because I usually don't, except for sporting events. But there, I, I can t- certainly admit that there are, is quality programming being produced. It's just the exception rather than the rule. Absolutely, you're right. Absolutely. There are like a five or so, like there's a handful of quality program on TV at any given moment, and they're all on different channels. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, like it does – having commercials, unfortunately, by definition, does break up pacing and drama. It does. It means that before you even sit down and write a script, you have to make concessions. Mm-hmm. And to do the same to video games would be a downgrade. It, it would be making a concession. Uh, I, my first thought about all this was that it's just – first of all, the internet would lose its goddamn mind. Of I couldn't even – I couldn't they'd, still, even... they'd still buy video games. They would buy these video games. They would pay through the nose to buy these video games. I, I couldn't even imagine the internet backdraft, though, can you? I couldn't. I can't even. It'd be like Mass Effect 3's ending times 100. Well, you know, like, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, internet rage has absolutely no bearing <laughs> yeah. whatsoever on sales. Diablo yeah. 3 has taught me that. SimCity mm-hmm. has taught me that. It's. I think it's yet to be seen if we see any long-term effects from that, but I, not immediately anyway. I'd be interested if they came out with SimCity 2, Always Online, if it would see the same sales. I, I I would hope they would be at least slightly lower. But, yeah. I'm just saying, though, if they hope ever... Is a, hope is a four-letter word, Austin. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay, let's just assume gaming budgets are out of control. There's just, they're just no way to solve that problem. Next-gen tech is just, there's too many, it's just too much asset uh, generation. There's just too many people to pay. you got to find a new way to monetize them. People aren't paying for microtransactions, whatever. you got to put commercials in them. People would flip a shit. But I feel like eventually we would kind of just lay back and take it. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. The internet would fucking lose its mind, but Metal Gear Solid Five <laughs> now with Mr. Clean. <laughs> People would be like, oh my god, this is so wrong. They'd be standing in front of the guy at GameStop, flipping through their billfold, like trying to dig out their fucking debit card, being like, I can't believe you're fucking doing this. This is unacceptable. Uh, here you go. Like, this is so wrong. I wish that... Okay, thank you. I'm just going to plug my PIN number in here. Oh god, this is awful. It's... No, actually, I don't need the warranty. Thank you very much. But oh, oh, you people, you, you're fucking vultures. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that in the bag. <laughs> Here's the thing, you use Metal Gear as an example. Um, Metal Gear Solid 4, between its missions, had like a 20 minute loading screen. I don't know if, are you aware of this? Where like it would just show a picture of Snake like smoking a cigarette while it installed yeah. the next part? Yeah, yeah. Like that's not a commercial, but conceivably they could just put commercials during those segments and it, it wouldn't have broken up the pacing any more than it was already broken up. Yeah, true, you might be right about that, but... I've got a solid state drive, bitch. Dude, solid state. Is, I don't even know how people don't solid state. How do I, you live? I, can, I could never go back again. Never. When I turn my computer on at fucking work, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Not this shit. Oh. oh. It's like dipping, your, uh, dipping a quill in ink after using a ballpoint pen. Yeah. Yeah. And, just, and fucking having to, like, dab the ink out and shit like that. It's, ah. Uh, <laughs> Fucking archaic. I feel like I'm living in the fucking 18th century. <laughs> oh, God. White people problems. Yeah, that's 